Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Playing the Long Game. My name is Tolgo Zirchu. I'm a faculty member in sport management here at UT Austin. We've got two great panels today, uh, but before we begin, I'd like to check in on a couple technical things. Uh, so we'll end both panels today with ample time for questions from you in the audience. You can access the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom window, and that'll submit questions at any point during the panels. Uh, the chat feature is also live if you'd like to use that, uh, but please try to put your questions to the panelists in the dedicated Q&A, and our moderators will do their best to get to as many questions as possible. Uh, we'd also like to encourage you to share your thoughts and reactions on social media. And if you don't mind using the hashtag play along, that's one word with a capital P and a capital L. And with that out of the way, uh, to get us started, I'd like to introduce our department chair in the Department of Kinesiology and Health Education, Dr. John Bartholomew. Thank you, Tolga. Are you hearing me all right? Yeah, you're good. All right, thank you, I'm sorry. Uh, so thank you for this and, and your work on playing the long game. I also wanna thank Jim Rooney for his support in making this reality. Tolga and Jim have been tremendous partners in organizing the event, and I can't thank them enough for all the work uh, that they did in pulling this together. And so on behalf of the Department of Kinesiology and Health Education at the University of Texas at Austin, I'm thrilled to welcome everyone to our first two panel sessions. We really appreciate you being a part of today's events, and I greatly appreciate the panelists for donating their time uh, to make it the special event that it is. I think that you will all find it to be a wonderful discussion and a nice example of the kind of impact we hope to achieve through our program in sport management. So to start things off, it is my pleasure to introduce Judy Bautista. Judy has been an award-winning journalist for 30 years, including nearly 15 at the New York Times. This represents a critical time for women as sports journalism was dominated by men and it was particularly difficult to build a career. This makes her success all the more impressive covering the NFL for 20 years, along with Major League Baseball, college football, and basketball on the local news. She rightly serves as an inspiration to all aspiring journalists, and it is my great pleasure to welcome Judy to introduce our first panel. Wow, that was very, very nice. I appreciate it. Very unexpected. Thanks very much for that introduction. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, my only regret is that we're not physically in Austin because somehow, as long as my career has been, I have never been to the University of Texas. So Hopefully we'll remedy that in future years, but thanks for having me. Let me uh, get right to the panelists. Um, I'm very bad at directions, screen directions, so just follow along. Uh, Laura Warren, I'm glad Laura got in, by the way, we were having a, an issue there, a technical issue, is the general counsel for the Chicago Fire of Major League Soccer. Matt Bowers, maybe a familiar face to those of you in Austin, associate professor, uh, professor of instruction in sports management at UT. Alan Harden, and this is a mouthful of a title, Executive Senior Associate Athletics Director, Performance, Health and Wellness. And I suspect Alan was very busy last year. And uh, finally, my colleague at the NFL, Leah Triola, Senior Director, Football Operations and Administration, who I think probably became an expert like so many of us did on testing and contact tracing last year, probably knows more about it than you ever wanted to know. Um, the purpose of this uh, panel before we get started is just to talk about the, the COVID season, what we learned, what, what the challenges were that were presented, um, what we are going to take away from it, good and bad, if, if in fact anything good can be said to have come of last season, um, how sports had to adjust. Um, I can tell you that when I started covering the NFL, I was told by a top NFL executive that sports does not change very quickly. He said the NFL turns like the Queen Mary. And that has been true most of the time until last year when, of course, everything had to change on a dime. I think the word reimagined was thrown out every day. We heard that this panel is going to discuss all of that. So I, I want to throw it to, to all of you first, and maybe we can just go around and talk about how things changed in your field, what how your job even changed, what your responsibilities were like. Leah, I want to start with you since you said in an email to me that you thought this might produce some PTSD. So I want to get this out of the way right away. Yeah, Tell me what about. a year. Yeah, what a um, year. So yeah, in my regular job, um, I'm in football operations, kind of dabble in really a little bit of everything, but my main focus is usually on 
policies that cover the integrity of the game, as well as um, I, I oversee the administration of the game officials CBA. So some people don't know that the game officials have their own union. We have a collective bargaining agreement with their union. So just overseeing the day-to-day -day administration of that. Um, this season, I was a contact tracer. I was an infection control officer. Um, just a little bit of everything to do with COVID. Um, so from a contact tracing perspective, we learned very early on that it was really important to make sure that we were tracing a positive case to know who they were around, you know, who, how the virus may have transmitted. Um, so there was a core team of us that became contact tracers for the clubs. Um, and we had a meeting every morning at 8.30 with um, football ops, management council, Dr. Sills, epidemiologists, and we would go through all the positive cases of the day. And um, we would just be assigned a case, sometimes several in a day, um, and would follow up with that club, talk to the player or whoever was the positive case, go through their last 48 hours, and then do the same thing with any of the close contacts that we felt needed to be followed up on. So it was a, you know, really took over each day um, really couldn't schedule things because we would have to be flexible. Things could shift. Um, I think that was probably one of the biggest themes of the season was just being flexible. You really couldn't um, be too committed to anything. Um, and just really working with the clubs and seeing the sacrifices that these clubs were making, the players, the coaches, the staff, everyone was fully committed to making this season work. Um, so contact tracing was a big part of my season, as well as being the infection control officer for the game officials. Um, and that included coming up with a testing operation for them. They, they tested not every day because they're not all in the same place um, every day, but at least once, maybe twice during the week and then the day before their game. Um, and they're spread all across the country, so it was very difficult to make sure that was done um, effectively and efficiently each week. But that was really the two main areas that I was involved in, as well as on game day. Um, we have a game day operations center here at the league office where we kind of watch, monitor all of the games and just serve as um, almost like a service center. So if there's any policy issues, this year COVID issues, um, we have a line directly to this room that clubs can call and we can help talk them through any policy issues or other concerns. Laura, since you were on the club side um, last year, I'm, I'm curious to know what life was like inside a club when seasons were blown up, schedules were blown up. How did you handle it? What were the challenges of the season? Yeah, it was, it was very, very hectic. So blown up is an effective work, right? Not that we can't manage the aftermath, but it was very, very hectic. I will share when you talk about how did it change your role, I actually joined right when it started. So I joined as the first lawyer that the club had had. I've been in my office all of two hours during the interview, but otherwise have met all of my colleagues through a computer screen. So I have been working during the pandemic remotely entire, the entire time. So it's been quite an interesting challenge on that side. Um, so I do, you know, I joined as the first lawyer for the club and I joined at a time when the industry was just upended trying to manage this and I would say, COVID has dominated my workload. So, you know, not only on the first team side and managing it for the professional team side, but also on the employment side with our staff. And then we have a host of youth programs and adult soccer programs as well. And managing COVID protocols in that space and our response planning and also coordinating with local officials and public officials. So I think on the, on the club side, it's just required people to really very quickly pivot as you alluded to and try to create new revenue streams, new protocols, new coordinating with stakeholders. So in some ways, you know, it's honestly been a very um, tight experience with the employees trying to manage all of those issues and get through those challenges and also focus on the sports season and doing it in a very, very safe way. So it's certainly been challenging, but I feel like the clubs have started to really have a consistent protocol and at least from our side the league has been very helpful in establishing that and I could say the same for the NFL you know I know they've done a very, a very good job with establishing higher level protocols that all the clubs can live up to then 
Alan and Matt, I don't know which one of you wants to follow on that, but I know you've got thoughts on, on those topics about how to adapt, how everybody had to adapt. Yes, Matt, you're, you're motioning to me. Yeah, um, well, thanks for having me, uh, Judy. I appreciate the time today. Um, you know, last year, like they've said, is, is a year like no other, and none of us could have anticipated what it, what it was really like. It takes me back to last March when we were in Kansas City for the Big 12 basketball tournament, and our team was already on the floor warming up when the, um, the, the notice came that they were canceling the tournament. So we had to pull them together, get both our men's and women's teams together, um, get them on the plane and come back to Austin. And it was the following day, I think many remember that um, the first case uh, associated with, with UT was reported and that happened to be um, our former president's wife and that's publicly known. So I'm not disclosing anything that others aren't aware of. But so that really um, sort of rocked our world. Suddenly what felt like was something that was very far away was upon us. So we, we were all sent home, the stay at home order. And we were first faced with just trying to figure out what was next. And the task at hand would be to figure out where our kids were, our kids meaning our student athletes, um, where, they, where they were gonna be for the next you know, short term, how to get them back safely, <clears throat> and then how to, to imagine starting to, to train and to work out and Oh, by the way, if we make it through that, we actually may play some games. So it was a really tall order. Um, and, and I'll take this, this moment to really laud the work that athletic trainers have done in the past you know, 12 to 14 months. I'm really critical people anyway. Uh, the contributions that they've made to particularly in college sports, but in pro sports as well. Um, and, and like the others have said, the, the, the testing, contact tracing, figuring out how to isolate a, a 20 year old kid that maybe lives in an apartment or other of his or her teammates. Um, those are things that are, are they were really taxing and an athletic trainers stepped in and have just done an amazing job. I've made so many close, you know, so many contacts with colleagues from across the country that are, that are saying the same things. And it was really an opportunity for them as a profession to rise to the occasion. And, and they've done just a remarkable job. I think that all of us, um, sort of the, the little adage I say is that we've all sort of earned our degree in epidemiology from the School of Hard Knocks over the last year. And uh, we, we, we've learned a lot. And frankly, we've accomplished a lot. And I think we're all very proud of, of, of where we've landed so far. Ash? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in real quick. I, you know, compared to everybody else, I had it pretty easy, I suppose. You know, I, I wasn't down in the, you know, on the front lines dealing with the, with the day to day logistics of this, which I, you know, can only imagine was exhausting um, and scary and sad and exciting and all of those things. Um, you know, I, the university setting was remote. Everything was, you know, I kind of went into my own little island and and that was fine. The challenge for us, of course, was we had. Uh, a cohort of graduating seniors and master's students entering a literal ghost town of job opportunities. Um, I, I remind a lot of the students who are, are getting ready to graduate now um, that thank goodness you weren't graduating last last spring because it was really that we didn't know anything. We didn't know what you were going into. The industry just sort of, you know, kind of consolidated and shrunk down to its bare minimum. And now it's scaling back up and there's more opportunities, certainly. But, um, you know, I've had the, the, I guess, good fortune of being able to be removed and to kind of observe and watch from a distance and, and to think about what, 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 you know, sports role in the things that we do um, and, and how COVID has amplified that. Um, and, and then you layer on top the, you know, the social justice um, movement going on during this same time. And, and I would argue that you know, perhaps never in the history of, of modern sports, maybe the civil rights era, right? But perhaps never has sports played a more kind of central role in the national conversations we're having about who we are, who we wanna be, how we wanna treat other people. And so in that sense, as, as scary and sad as, as this time has been, it was, it was kind of exciting as well. And I think it, it, it further elevated the role of sports in um, and how we think about who we are. 
I actually want to pick up on a thread you just said. Um, I was struck, so I was covering the NFL, and I was struck by how uh, adapting to the pandemic uh, affected everything. Everything was changed in some way. Obviously, the Super Bowl was, the draft was changed entirely. But even just day-to-day -day interactions were changed. Uh, training camp was changed. Interviews with players were changed. Every facet of the season was changed. A and I wonder now that we're sort of maybe coming through on the other side, we hope, what are, what are we going to take from this? Is there anything we're going to carry forward um, from last season? Or are we going to say like, thank God that's over. Let's never think about it again. What are your, Matt, as you said, like you sort of got to watch it maybe from 30,000 feet. What, what do you think? Are we going to take anything out of this? I think so. Yeah, I do. And, and I read a great book early on in the pandemic called Post Corona by a, an NYU professor named Scott Galloway. And he, he sort of equated the pandemic, you know, we, we kept wanting to talk about it as like, uh, you know, a, a hindrance or, you know, kind of standing in the way of things. And he actually described it as an accelerant. So it, it was actually kind of speeding up the timetable that was already kind of on its trajectory, but it just accelerated it. And, and in, you know, in preparation for this, this chat, I was thinking a bit about that metaphor. And, and I almost think of the way COVID and sports interacted almost more as like a wildfire. I think it, it came through it burned down a lot of things to our, our roots, our like most basic level of trying to understand why sports matter and how they can play a role in society. And, and when you boil it down to that, you've got, you know, sports are a way to, to create connection with people. Sports are a way to create identity. Sports are a way to have experiences that are meaningful to you. And I think one of the things that I take from this, and as I look at the successes of, of the pandemic, which is a weird thing to say, when I look at the, the organizations that have had success and I look at the ones that are emerging, I think a, a lot of that success comes from tapping into those kind of roots of, of why sports are, are so important in our everyday lives. So I actually think COVID has sort of forced us to, to revisit those and re-examine our priorities as we as we kind of reconfigure for, for moving forward. And I'm curious to see if, you know, how others feel who are in, in it a little more than I am. Yeah, Leah, I'm, I'm curious to what you think. I know I've heard NFL people talk about the accelerant in particular, things that were accelerated, but what you think the NFL might've learned from last year that's going to carry forward, or maybe what the NFL learned and they can't wait to throw in the trash can, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think what you said in the beginning, Judy, that everything, like everything flipped upside down. Um, I felt like we were almost reinventing the league because we had to think through every single aspect and think about how it could be done differently while still accomplishing the same purpose. Think through what it meant to, you know, just operate a football team, operate a game and go step by step and think, okay, well, here's a touch point here where two people have a meeting, now it needs to be virtual. And just think through how we could distance people, have the PPE and still, you know, get accomplish what our goals were. And that was very, very challenging. Um, and so, yeah, there were a lot of changes you saw on game day, the sidelines were very clear. You saw, um, you know, the reporters and a lot of the media up in that op zone um, that first row of the stadium bowl. Um, so there was a lot of changes just to what you saw on game day and even more of what you did not see. Um, I think a lot of, at least on game day, there have been things that we've talked about before, like, you know, should we limit how many people are on the sideline? And this gave us a chance to see, well, what is the bare minimum that we could get down to to actually still operate the game? Um, and then we build from there. So. I don't think anyone wants to be quite as restrictive as we were last season, um, but it's kind of a starting point to help us figure out, okay, you know, it does contribute to player health and safety to try to limit some of the numbers. So where can we do that? A lot of the game day roles were consolidated, some were eliminated, just to try again to limit that number of people down there. Um, to the extent that we could continue that way, there might be a few positions that, you know, we we have eliminated for the just ongoing, but um, we don't want it to affect the game if it doesn't you know, need to be eliminated. 
So there will be some changes, maybe not so obvious to um, the viewers, but we are hoping to get back to normal, obviously reviewing policies again for this season, how they can be relaxed, what needs to remain the same. Obviously vaccination is playing a big part in that now. Um, so it's, it's continuing to be a learning process. But one of the things I've seen come out of this is just the collaboration. We collaborated with the teams, with media, uh, with the unions, with the departments at, here at the league. Um, the collaboration was something I've never seen before. And I think that's something that will continue going forward. Whereas in the past, people were very focused on the role that they played. You know, each department is kind of focused on what their goals are. But this season we were forced to work with each other because we all had one goal. Um, and that was to get through the season, play every game and get to the Super Bowl, which we did. And we would not have done that without taking every aspect of the game into consideration. So I definitely foresee that piece remaining, as well as just being more innovative, um, how we engage fans. Um, you know, just taking that more, like that daring approach to what can we include in our game, whereas most major sports leagues are rooted in tradition. And that's kind of what's so great about the NFL and the other leagues. Um, people love tradition, it's tried and true. But now we're going to be breaking out of that mold a little bit more. Um, and I think it's just going to be really important to see how things shift and, and how we just have, see the game in a whole new way. Laura, since you came to the job fresh um, and, and you got to see how the club operated from a clean point of view, are, are there things you saw this year, things you had to do because of the pandemic that maybe you liked, um, that worked, that you think, um, you know, in soccer that will, will carry forward? Yeah, I think there were there were a few things. I mean, I would echo what Leah said about innovation. I feel like it really forced creativity. And I think particularly for MLS, it was looking at how do we create revenue outside of the game day experience, right? If this happens again, can we have other sources of revenue besides fans showing up in seats. There was a big emphasis on creativity in the broadcast experience. So what are the other ways that people can consume our product when they're not there in person and how can we get creative to draw people to it? And I feel like that was a really a plus for us. I also think technology is another aspect that will really continue moving forward. This forced updates to technology within stadium, right? Or there's you know potentially vaccination apps that are coming out now um, check, just checking in with the symptom screening through apps. And so lots of ways to communicate within your club through technology and also with your fans through technology that I think will continue to grow. And then I think this is true probably for any entity coming out of the pandemic, just flexible working arrangements and, you know, having, figuring out people are capable of working in different environments and being forced to go through that, I think really opened the eyes to a lot of organizations about how can we do this differently and still have effective employee engagement and effective contribution? I'm kind of curious, Alan, since you're, um, you know, in a, in a real management position over, over the whole university athletic department, I'm curious what you think normal is going to look like is, I, I don't even know if you think we're close to normal, but what do you imagine normal is going to be whenever we get there? You know, that's, that's a great question. I I don't think anybody has any idea what normal means anymore. Um, the things I, I agree, particularly with Laura, the things that that I think will carry over will be the sense of flexibility that in athletics we've really never had. I mean, athletics is built on doing the things that have made people successful, they hang on to. So think about just how we operate daily from team meetings to locker room use to lifting weights to um, uh, team meals, things that that as we entered this, you know, we scratched our head and said, you know, how in the world can we do these things? Um, do you using basketball as an example, do you have to have a locker room to be able to practice basketball? Well, we decided in this case, they really probably didn't. So you know, when we broached things like basketball games, and okay, you need to keep six feet between you, and we're going to have to figure out how to accommodate that 
you know, for your bench area and first response would be, well, but that's not what we do. Well, we have to, we have to be creative and figure it out. And now when I see those bench areas, particularly in the, in the um, NCAA tournament, like I see that and it looks normal to me. So maybe that is normal. Maybe we will be sort of in that capacity for some period of time. I do think that, that vaccinations are really going to move the, I hate to say move the needle, it sounds like a pun, but, um, you know, I think oh, that, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what's going to get us there, obviously. Uh, but then, you know, in, in a team setting, are we then going to be faced with groups that are vaccinated and groups that are unvaccinated and trying to figure out how to manage them sort of separately and in a way that keeps each of those groups safe, yet allowing some relaxing of some of the guidelines we've had in place for, for those to, to keep them safe. So, you know, I don't know what normal is going to be like. I do think there'll be some sort of testing construct for a period of time. Um, what that looks like, I don't know. And that's something that we've been so focused on for the past year that a, a world without COVID testing to me, um, I'm not sure what I'd do with all my extra time, but uh, I, I do think that we're going to be faced with these types of decisions for uh, a, a fairly significant amount of time. It certainly seems like the vaccine issue is probably going to be this year's version of, of testing, right? Lots of decisions are going to have to be made around vaccines. And I, I suspect just from knowing the NFL, I mean, I think these are going to be pretty sensitive decisions and there, it's going to be, there's going to be quite a balancing act just from some of the memos that have already gone out. I wonder if, I, I know from covering sports, I was surprised. I only covered in person this year, five games. One of them was the Super Bowl um, because there was no access at the stadiums. Um, but one of the things I noticed, I went to the season opener in Foxborough and it was completely silent. They had no fans in New England this year. And it, this year gave me a, an appreciation. I did not know that I was taking them for granted I apologize, but it really gave me an appreciation for the role fans play and how how integral they are to sports and, and the atmosphere that we think of at big events. And, and I wonder, I sort of look at that as like a positive, if I could think of anything coming out of this year as a positive, I, I view that as a positive that I think we maybe have a greater appreciation for some elements that we had probably taken for granted. I wonder if any of you uh, have thoughts about that, not just specific to fans, but just bigger picture, if anything positive came out of this in your mind? Well, I, you know, I think, um, again, the, the innovation has been the, the theme so far, but, you know, when I look at kind of coming back to those basics of like why sports work, you know, it was interesting to see some things sort of emerge during this time. I know there was a lot of you could look at the ratings of more kind of traditional sports and things and be kind of discouraged about, you know, how the level of engagement in that regard. But then you could look at um, the ratings across women's sports, for example, and see some real signs of encouragement. And I think we're at a real inflection point for, for women's sports in general. You know, I, th I think we are seeing um, you know, the, the real emergence of the NWSL as a viable long-term league product potentially um, I think we're seeing an emergence of um, kind of for us by us types of, of media outfits and um, you know ways where, where female athletes are coming together and creating new spaces to, to kind of host new discussions and conversations and and so I think we're at an inflection point for that I think this period has been one where we've seen the emergence of of things that have been a little bit more peripheral, um, taking on maybe slightly bigger roles than they've had in the past because of their ability to speak to specific communities and to connect and, and cultivate that identity. Um, and you know, we could get into the all the, the NFTs and the esports and all that stuff too. But I think, you know, when I look at at takeaways from this pandemic, I, I feel like we may look back and say, that was a real tipping point for the viability of women's sports on a, on a much more national scale than, than what we've seen. And, and uh, again, I'm, I'm curious what others may think about that, but that's, that's something I've observed. Anybody else wanna weigh in on that? Any positives you think have come through this? 
Yeah, I would agree with Matt. And actually, Matt, go back to your reference to kind of that community aspect too. Now, I say all this, we're heading into our home opener on Saturday with fans for the first time. So to be determined, right? But I also wonder if, you know, at least for me, as I'm watching sports pick up again and fans in the stands, it's such a sense of hope and relief and wondering, does it give some sense of proportion that it returns to that kind of community focus and is less about the wins and losses? I feel like that may wear off quickly, but I also feel like at least coming back in, we're just so grateful to be having the experience to be together with people that there's a real focus from the teams, the leagues, and the fans on that community piece as much as the game itself or the outcome. Leah, I know you mentioned fans to me. It was so odd to not have the fans in the stands. I mean, just seeing on TV, having some empty stadiums. I didn't go to a game until postseason, but it was very strange and definitely um, gave me a new appreciation for you know having a stadium full of fans. Um, and it's funny because we had to adjust some of our policies to account for that, where normally artificial crowd noise is prohibited. We now required that this season um, so that there was some sort of like baseline murmur in the stadium. And I'd heard from you know coaches, players that it took them a while to really get used to that because it almost felt like they were just you know scrimmaging. And to remind yourself, oh yeah, this is a game. Um, really does show how much of an impact fans have. So I think we're going to continue to look for ways to engage the fans and just make a better experience for them in stadium once we do return to having full stadiums. Alan, is that, uh, you think that's, I imagine when college sports comes back full-fledged, we'll we'll go back to having 90,000 people in a stadium and it'll feel very normal, but is, is that a piece that affected college sports as well. Oh, yeah, of, of course, and, and probably in a different way. I think with some of the pro leagues, um, you know, I understand is their revenue source is so um, TV uh, dependent. Um, you know, college football particularly is very gate dependent. So I've heard 80-20, the fact that, um, you know, 80% of the revenue comes from, from people sitting in the seats. So a, a college football season with no fans um, is not a college football season. It probably just doesn't happen. Um, you know, aside from all the, whether it's the baseline murmur that you miss, I've never heard that. I like that, that comment. Um, and, and just the, the camaraderie, camaraderie and the sense of community and all those things. I think there's an emphasis on having fans in the stadium that is probably has implications in college football that may not may not carry over to some of the pro leagues. Matt, I wanted to ask you, you, you talked earlier about um, having to counsel those graduating students going into this uh, non-existent job market, a completely frozen job market. I, I wonder maybe bigger picture, like what, what do we think the business of sports is going to look like going forward? Is it going to snap back to 2019 what what it was is it going to be diminished uh is might it be expanded what if when you're counseling students now who are about to go into the market or maybe a year or two down the road start their careers wh what are you telling them about their careers and what to expect well yeah that that's the question right is what what does 2022 look like what does 2023 look like and i you know, I think we've seen maybe a slightly like more rapid scaling back up than than maybe I expected as as it feels like we got over the hump with the vaccines and and, you know, with a lot of the fall, you know, sports and the cycles. So like it's all about kind of when things fall. And so in autumn, as as things are getting ready to, to start back up and we're in Texas, so we're default to thinking about football, of course. Um, you know, I, I see organizations scaling up, but, you know, I, I think this has been an opportunity to sort of on, a, on an industry scale revisit thinking about what our revenue models look like and, and how that is, how they're, how they're maybe a little bit more protected going forward, what, where the risks are, where they aren't. And I think that's why you're seeing leagues so aggressively move into some of these really rapidly emerging spaces like like the the nfts um the non-fungible tokens that 
um, NBA Top Shot was kind of the, the big first one, but now Major League Baseball just signed a deal with Tops to do that as well. And so, you know, I think the, the broader sports industry has been sort of scrambling to figure out new revenue sources to be able to, to protect a little bit from, from, you know, what we've just experienced where you take all those gate receipts away, you take, you know, like all of that. And it really kind of devastates the, the financial model that we've traditionally utilized. So, you know, for students, it just becomes even, even harder. It's insanely hard to work in sports, you know, like it's a supply and demand issue. And so um, we have the top, however many percent of students in Texas, top 6%, 8%, whatever it is these days to get in. And we have wonderful students who come in and they work hard and they do internships and they, you know, they do everything right. And it's still hard to get really good jobs. And so um, I'm encouraging students to be as, as sort of entrepreneurial in their job search as they can be as well. You know, I, I, we're, we're seeing some success with students, well, certainly some success in, with students landing in traditional major pro leagues and teams and major college sports, but, but also looking in, in areas that are maybe sports adjacent, you know, like a lot of the tech startup, Austin is a big tech scene and, and looking at opportunities that were maybe a background in sports and understanding the, how, to, how to work in a team, how to work hard, how to do all those things that make our students marketable. Um, but maybe just in a, in a slightly different, different setting. Um, and that's not to crush their dreams or say you shouldn't work in sports, but just to, to broaden that because I think the industry itself is still kind of figuring out what staffing looks like, what the, the financial models will, will be as we move forward. And, and we just, like you said, we just don't quite know at this stage. Leah, you, you mentioned something very early on about like what we all learned, I think, was to be flexible and be prepared to pivot. And your job is your job description might not exactly match what you're going to end up doing. And I, I wonder if that if we're going to see more of that going forward, like I said, when as these students sort of get into the job market, if that's going to be even more important as sports emerges in whatever fashion it's going to emerge. I, I definitely think so. I mean, I know several people here at the league office and even at the clubs whose roles have totally changed and are going to remain like that going forward um, because they've learned, you know, they've discovered a new skill set that they have or they discovered a new passion um, and they're just going to continue forward with that. And I think it really opens up a lot more opportunities for people because as leagues are starting to shift and you said reimagining that definitely is a buzzword this year we're reimagining everything events how we operate and that's going to open up more opportunities for people um and i think we're as we learn together how to deal with covid and you know there's always going to be something new on the horizon but with covid we're all on equal playing field because we're all learning about it together and how to deal with it so everyone has an opportunity to kind of reach out and solve an issue or fill a gap. Um, and I think as long as you are willing to be flexible and you're willing to be a team player, jump in and help out, even if it's not really something that's within your wheelhouse, um, it'll help you become more well-rounded and just open up more opportunities. Lauren, Ellen, either one of you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I just add, when you're talking about sports opportunities and Matt mentioned kind of the sports adjacent companies, I feel like that's a great chance to get into if you're looking at the companies that sponsor sporting events, right? There's a ton and there's folks on that side who are collaborating with the folks who work in the, the league and the team side. So that's another good opportunity. And I also feel like, you know, with the emphasis now and so much more awareness, much needed awareness on diversity and inclusion, I think there's also a, a concept of cognitive diversity and making sure I think sports entities are slowly becoming aware that, you know, we may have been somewhat insular and that there are lots of other areas and expertises of, for people who have not developed their skill set in sports and see sports with a fresh perspective and therefore bring that innovation and that flexibility that maybe the sports leagues don't have. So if you're not starting in sports, if you can think of a way to bring your skill set to sports, I think there's a lot of opportunity there to develop. 
Yeah, I'll just I'll just add that I think all of our organizations are probably smaller than they were a year ago, and um, we rely on every one of our coworkers to help. So I think you know someone trying to get into this setting, um, you know, be willing to take on any role and any task and and learn from it and develop your skill set. I think that opportunity will present itself just by the sheer nature of 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 a small organization trying to execute a still you know monumental task. Before we go to questions, we're going to go to questions. We have some good ones already. I, I want to ask each of you, when you reflect on last year, we hope it's only going to be one year, but when you reflect on last year, what's what's your big takeaway from, from what you experienced and what your workplace experienced? Whoever wants to go first. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in and just, I think it's that we can accomplish um, nearly anything when we work together and we're determined to do that. And really, I think just the, the thought of playing a football game seemed virtually impossible. And, you know, we started from this position of looking at, at, at risk stratification for sports and assuming that those that have close contact i.e. tackling, blocking, that, that sort of thing, that they would be at really high risk to transmit the disease to each other. That was also at a time that we were practicing um, guilty as charged, sort of this hygiene theater, right? Where we're cleaning every surface and we're cleaning the footballs that they're passing. And we're afraid that if a quarterback throws to a receiver and the quarterback's infected, the receiver is going to catch the ball and get it. Um, fortunately, we've moved past that sort of thing. But um, you know, there's so many details that you have to think through to get you to the end point and, and everyone chipping in and, and, and working together and, and working towards a common goal. I think that's what I'm left with is that, that we did it and we're not done, but we did what I think most people um, thought was impossible. And that's across the industry. I think I learned that um communication really is key. And I mentioned earlier the collaboration that we experienced this year. Between those two things, we wouldn't, if we didn't have a strong communication and collaboration as we had, we would not have made it through. Um, so I think that was a real big positive that came out of it. People became closer, our work relationships became stronger. Um, and also just learned that you really have to take things one step at a time. If Back in March, we thought about, oh, how are we going to get to the Super Bowl? It would have been too much. We wouldn't have been able to handle that sort of pressure. We had to really just take it one step at a time. And I remember there were so many working groups and work streams this year, and it started with return to facilities. And our goal was just to get clubs back into their facilities because they were shut down. Um, and then once we were allowing coaches back in, we were trying to get players in. And then it was returned to work, getting them you know, to be able to conduct training camps. Then it was returned to play. So it was returned to everything, but we had to start somewhere and just little by little get one step at a time, get to the Super Bowl. But it's, it seems too overwhelming when you look too far down the line. Um, so really just taking that one step at a time and accomplishing small goals to get to the bigger goal. I would say that was one of my takeaways. Somebody said this to me very early on. I think it was during the draft last year was don't make a decision before you have to make a decision because the information you have is going to change. And as we saw last year, it changed dramatically and rapidly. Um, like you said, I mean, certainly last year at this time, I thought, how the heck are they ever going to have a football season? And even when opening day, when we got to September, uh, people at the NFL network were saying to me, do you think they're going to make it through the season? I said, well, I think they're going to start on time. I have no idea if they can finish on time. And my takeaway was that things were changing. They were changing the rules. They were changing protocols, but they didn't make decisions un until they had as much information as they could possibly get. Um, and that was something I learned instead of rushing in. And as you said, like, what are we going to do about the Super Bowl? You know, in March, like, no, just like you got to wait until you have things will change before you get to that point. Anyway, I'm sorry to interrupt. Keep going. That was it for me. 
Lauren, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Oh, sorry, Lauren. Um, yeah, I'll jump in. You know, here in Austin, we are the we call ourselves the live music capital of the world. And, um, you know, I remember very distinctly, it's like a, you know, kind of almost like a 9-11 type of JFK moment when um, we can't canceled South by Southwest, which is probably the first major event to be canceled in the country. And really, you know, you had Rudy Gobert testing positive with the jazz and then South by Southwest canceling. Um, and that really set off the, the dominoes, which would have been set off anyway. But, but I think back to that and, and I think about this, this past year and the role that sports and events um, and entertainment play in shaping the identity of a place and the challenges to that and how difficult it can be when you live in Austin and you can't go to Longhorn games and you can't go honky tonkin and you can't go see live music or whatever it may be right so it was a real challenge to our 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 sense of place and identity and and I think a lot of people are feeling that all over when you just have to shut down and and become this sterile you know isolated version of of any town USA, more or less. Um, and so, I, you know, I think a lot about that. I also think I have a strong identity to my, my hometown area, which is the Tampa Bay area. And I thought there was nothing more fitting in 2020 than to subject the rest of the country to Tampa doing really well in like a bunch of sports. So we won the Super Bowl, we won the Stanley Cup, we went to the World Series. It was like a weirdly bittersweet kind of thing to to follow, but um, but yeah, again, it was like that ability that sports gives to to connect back to to how we think of ourselves, and and this was a real challenge to that. Yeah, way to rub it in there, Matt. <laughs> I, I totally would too. If it was my team, I'd be all over that. <laughs> uh, I I couldn't agree with you more. I will just add. I think my takeaway from the year is just resilience. I feel like um, you know, having lived through it, with frankly all new colleagues and all new, it feels as though we've had the relationships longer than we have because of the experience. And it was such an opportunity to lead. And I think it offers lessons about how you take that going forward. You had to lead, as you pointed out, Judy, in an environment where you can't make decisions until the last minute and you have to be ready to change them and you have to have contingency plans. And so I think those are kind of leadership lessons on how to manage unpredictable environments, which we know will come again, right? Yeah, Judy, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll add one more thing that I was just thinking about. Something Laura said kind of triggered it in my mind. Uh, you know, I think I, I do a lot of work in, in at the national level, looking at youth sports and athlete development and how we, how we try to make that work better, um, which is, is always a fun battle. But, you know, when you, we look at from the pro levels all the way down to the, the youth levels, I think one of the takeaways is the impact that our governance structure has on, um, you know, the challenges that are created in managing something that's this large scale. So, you know, we tend to be a sort of federalist, like let the states decide, let the market decide. And we saw that, that, that you know, when we're applying that across a league that has 32 teams or 30 teams or whatever in different states, um, or, you know, you've got 50 different kind of approaches to handling youth sports or whatever it may be. It creates real challenges when you're trying to operate on a, on a broader scale. Um, I mean, there were teams that didn't get to play, um, you know, pro teams that didn't get to play in their home stadiums, you know, and, and so. Still aren't. Um, and still aren't. Yeah. And so I think that was something that, that sort of quietly, um, you know, popped up to me as like, yeah, this was a real reminder that this is kind of how we roll. So there's some good to that um, in, in, in many ways, and, but there's some challenges, particularly when you're coordinating uh, national level efforts. I do think um, having observed sports for this long, um, I, I think the, the ability to be flexible was something I wasn't sure we all had in sports. Um, and we found out obviously that we did and really took great success in many cases, the NFL's case certainly was a great success. Um, and, and I think that's probably a good thing going forward. I mean, we all learned to operate in ways that were much different from the ways we entered the year thinking we we're gonna operate. I've got a, I mean, I'm doing this from a set in my apartment, which never existed before about a year ago. And there's millions of examples of things like that, of people 
adjusting on the fly um, and, and it working. I mean, it really to, I think to an astonishing degree, it, it worked quite well in sports. I wanna get to um, some questions. I wanna start with a question that was actually posed yesterday, but which I, I think applies really well to, to this panel. Maybe uh, Matt, actually you just mentioned youth sports, so this might go very well to that, but Matt and Alan, you might be able to weigh in on this. This was a question from, and I hope I don't butcher this name, Jonathan Shivers. I hope that's the right way to say it. Um, is there a shorter time frame for athletic development because the pandemic put sports on hold for a year? I think the short answer is probably, right? I mean, we don't know exactly what the impact will be. Um, I, I do a, a, a quite a bit of work with a group called the Aspen Institute, and um, they're leading a lot of the conversation and a lot of the, the research that's going into to looking at youth athlete development. And and as as they conducted studies over over this period, the data were not particularly encouraging. You know, I think there was there was um, a clear sense emerging from that data that we're seeing a divide widen that already existed between kids who and you know and, and young athletes who have access resources, you know, everything they need to be successful, and then the kids who don't. And that was already a, an issue pre-pandemic. And now it's one that um, has just been, you know, kind of magnified as a result of this. And so, uh, and we've also seen in, in the data too, a lot of reports of, of kids who have kind of diminished interest in sports as a result of, of this past year and stepping away from things. And, and a number of kids, uh, I'm, I'm rounding here, but about 20% of the families surveyed in some of these surveys were saying, yeah, we don't know if we're gonna come back to, um, to play sports. And so that has really long-term ramifications for our entire system for, you know, for lack of a better term, because it's not exactly a system. Um, and when we think about developing athletes, so it's, yeah, I think it, it, we're seeing already some of the short-term impacts of this, but, but certainly if you, if you stepped away for a year, I mean, that, that developmentally could be, could be really critical. And I was reading a great article that unfortunately, I think it was in Texas monthly. I, I apologize, but that was profiling the, um, a couple of high school football programs across the, the New Mexico and Texas borders. They were just two, three miles apart, but because of state level differences in policies, the Texas team had a full, full season, didn't miss a game, didn't miss practices. The New Mexico team fully shut down because of the, the state level approach. And so you can see how even just kids that are two, three miles apart can have a drastically different pandemic experience in terms of their, their development as, as athletes. Alan, I, obviously kids who are student athletes at the University of Texas are at a pretty high level um, relative to most. Uh, but I, I do wonder how the sort of jumble of what sports became last year, you think might have affected them as they mature. Yeah, you know, I think ours did a really remarkable job of, of still working, quite frankly. Um, I do think, you know, to, to Matt's point, in, in youth sports, um, certainly high school sports, time lost probably does create uh, more significant disparities. And I think, you know, we'll see that over time. Um, but I do, I really think that, that certainly at the level that, that our student athletes participate um, and, you know, peer institutions as well, I think we were able to provide uh, the resources that they needed to not really lose a step or, 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 or miss a beat. And I think you'll see that um, assuming the Olympics, uh, you know, are held. I think that you'll see that that world records will fall just like they anticipated and they have in previous years. Um, but I do think that points to that disparity and, 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 and the folks that we have at this level that are gonna find a way to train and those in maybe youth groups or youth organizations or high schools um, that don't have that access, it's gonna impact them probably in a pretty adverse way. I'm going to uh, start going to questions from the Q&A section and then there's one in the chat. So bear with me because if I screw up the technology, nobody would be surprised. But in the chat, uh, this is a good question and really current, certainly in the NFL, it's really current. 
uh, how are teams and entities handling situations in which athletes or other staff are not comfortable getting vaccinated? We've all made the point that vaccine is uh, a huge component of returning to something close to normal. Um, I, I know the NFL just sent out a memo to staff today about um, they expect staff to, to get vaccinated or you're not going to, if you're in a job that has contact with the players, you're, you're not going to be doing that job. But I, I broadly, I wonder uh, how you think organizations are gonna be able to handle this. Lilia, you, you might as well start since we're current. Sure. Yep. The memo addressed, um, you know, to be eligible for those tier one or tier two statuses, the vaccine would be required, of, although, of course, there are medical and religious exemptions. Um, I think the the approach we're trying to take is really education, um, especially on the player side. It will not be mandated, um, but just really offering. We've offered several education sessions at this point with Dr. Sills and an NFL NFLPA advisor. Um, just sharing all the information we know so far and helping them become comfortable with the idea of it and being able to ask, ask questions of their club staff. Um, so really just trying to get through this together because, you know, it is very new for everyone. Um, so we're, we're definitely still trying to work through all these nuances, but trying to take the approach that education, providing education is the best way. Laura, what's the uh, what's the policy situation going to be for MLS? Yeah, it's it's the same for us. So strongly encouraging vaccination, and then if folks have concerns or questions, making sure that they're educated about what's out there and trying to really hear those concerns. And we found that overwhelmingly, folks want access to the vaccine. So trying to also just make sure that we can get that access. Obviously, when our time comes, and that is you know quickly approaching, at least in Illinois for us, but making sure that when the time opens up that we're getting everybody access who wants it. And overwhelmingly, it seems like folks do want to get the vaccine. Alan, is, is it going to be any different? College is obviously a little bit different. Yeah, it is. And, and um, you know, as a state institution, I don't think we're positioned to be able to require anyone to get it. We've started vaccinating our kids, um, started about 10 days ago, and we're, we're, our percentages are going to be very, very high. Um, you know, we, we've taken the, the time to sit and educate kids and parents if they're so inclined, um, like the others have said they've done. And um, I don't think a, this pressure campaign, uh, you know, is, is effective. I think if we can educate them on what this means to them and what maybe some of our post-vaccination guidance may look like, we've tried to sort of slow roll that to this point because you know, as we've learned from the past year, we still don't really know. Um, we think there's some things that will be able to be more flexible and sort of relax. Um, so that's, I think, some, some things that they're interested in. You know, the bottom line is they just, they want to get back to kind of what you said previously, to normal, to, to playing sports. Um, and we feel strongly that, that vaccinations are the way to, you know, get there the most, uh, the most effectively. So, um, but yeah, we don't we don't have the ability to to um, require it of anyone, so it does make it a bit more challenging for us. Um, I, I this just popped into my head, but one thing the the county where the Buffalo Bills are located just announced today that they hope to have full stadiums. The NFL hopes to have full stadiums in the fall, and they are are good with full stadiums as long as everybody can show proof of vaccination. And that's the first I've heard, at least on the NFL side, of, of a situation like that. And I, I'm fascinated to see what the different rules are going to be, because obviously it, New York has been very strict all along. There were no fans uh, all through the season. And I'm curious to see how many more might go that route where you have to show you know, some kind of the vaccine passports we've all heard so much about. Um, let me get to uh, other questions. Um, this one is for Alan. Uh, it says, with colleges and uh, with colleges and universities going to online, how has that transition helped or hurt the student athletes and coaches? Good question. Um, you know, I think it's probably allowed more flexibility of schedule. Because as we know, many of the classes, if they're online, um, they may not be at a specific assigned time. 
So I think that has probably made, um, made it more convenient for many of our student athletes. Um, uh, so I think, I think flexibility in time was probably the, the biggest thing. Um, they've really responded remarkably well. I think this concept of you know, early on, it was like, there's no way we're going to move to virtual classes. Kind of when you talk about moving back to the theme of being flexible and being able to accomplish what you have to when you, when you really have to. Um, it's been, I would say, a largely positive experience for, for many of them. Um, they've, I still think, been able to develop relationships with faculty and, and um, done really tremendously well. So from an athletic standpoint, I think that it has just allowed a lot more flexibility of schedule um, and certainly fewer missed class days, right, with travel. Yes. Um, this is, I think, is a question really that all of you will be interested to see what you say uh, about fans in the stands or the lack there of fans in the stands last year. How much economic impact did that have that shaped decisions uh, throughout the season? Right. That's a tough one. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, we just we were really painfully aware that, um, like I said earlier, without without fans in the stands, there probably isn't a football season um, in, in college anyway. Uh, that that was something that we always thought of. We were trying to help get there. But, you know, the bottom line, although we were involved in a lot of decisions in terms of capacity and how to how to have a safe environment we were really primarily focused on what was happening on the field. Um, so, you know, while, while we did help guide that uh, and, and everybody's goal was to have fans in the stands, um, it, didn't, it didn't change our focus from our student athletes and what we were trying to accomplish. Yeah, Judy, I just wanna make sure I understand the question. So how much did the, the economics of not having fans actually shape how you decided how to handle it? Uh, no, how did it shape decisions? I, I'm assuming the question is more just how did it shape decisions um, within the league or within the team, uh, the, the lack of fans and the revenue impact of having no fans? Right. I mean, I think it had a, a big impact like any like anything would, right? That's taking away a huge source of revenue. So I think it had a very big impact. It forced you to prioritize what's going to be most important for us this season. But I will say, I don't feel like it impacted the decisions that we made to protect health and safety, whether it's of player staff or for us with the youth programs as well. And in fact, on the youth side, you know, it's interesting, Matt, as you're talking about athlete development, we saw a lot of diversity in how families wanted to manage playing. And we made conservative decisions about not opening programs or not traveling across borders that were very unpopular sometimes with some of the families and decided, you know, despite it was going to hurt us economically, just felt like it was best overall for health and safety. So I think it's safe to say it absolutely played a big decision, except when it came to those health and safety decisions. I think I it's almost, to, I think it's, oh, I'm sorry, Judy, I, but I think it's almost gonna be more interesting this year, um, this season. I think there was a general sense that like, all right, we've got to eat it. We don't know what, we don't know what, this what's going on we don't know how to handle this we we, we got a plan on really taking a huge hit here now however as we know there's a path toward getting back it'll be really interesting and of course politically charged as everything is to see how many teams follow suit with with like what the bills are doing because obviously you want to maximize capacity right you want to you want to get as many people in there as you can while also walking that that political line of not alienating certain you know segments of your fan base, and so that's where I'm really fascinated to to kind of watch unfold. Um, and as like Buffalo does it, does it become easier for the Giants to do it and the Jets and the, you know like it, where do the dom do the dominoes start to to fall with that? I think it's um, I think it's going to be something to to definitely watch. Kind of unfold over the coming months and maybe i'm more titillated by it than other people but i think it's going to be like the issue as we're we're trying to make our return so i i agree i think I, as we were talking about i think that how they handle vaccines how leagues handle vaccines for players and staff is going to be fascinating but then i think like what kind of precautions 
are going to be in place for fans because I think we all, I mean, we all love the idea of full stadiums. That's great, but what does that mean? Um, and how do you do that safely uh, in this environment? And, and when do you ease off on restrictions on fans? Like when do we, do we get to an end point? Um, certainly it's very important in the NFL. Uh, Leah could say more about this, but there's no question the drop in revenue because of no fans affected the salary cap. The salary cap went down, which it never does. And that hamstrung a whole lot of teams. Um, and, and there were very, very few teams that could be fully active in free agency this year. We saw lots of teams, uh, including I think the Pittsburgh Steelers, Jim Rooney would probably say it himself, that were affected adversely by the drop in the salary cap. Um, there's no question it played, a, it played an enormous role. Um, here is, uh, I think, a really good question. What was the most unique or innovative solution your respective organizations came up with during the pandemic? Who goes first here? That is a good question. I feel like I, I really didn't pay much attention to innovative solutions. I was more so focused on restrictive solutions. Um, so it's kind of hard to think about on the spot, but I do recall just seeing a lot of interesting things implemented into the stadium, um, like the selfie cam, the players having that um, camera to you know celebrate in front of after a score or a big play. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool. And just a lot of the fan cams from home. So I thought they did a good job with implementing that fan engagement from uh, remotely. Um, good question. I'm sure I could think of a better. I thought the draft, what, the whole what about draft the draft? Yeah, that's what that's what I was gonna say oh, too. Yeah, if we're gonna think a year ago. That was that was <laughs> incredible. Incredible, incredible. <laughs> I've forgotten about that. That was so long ago at this point. <laughs> Laura, how about uh, how yeah? About I think, of course, you put me on the spot. It's tough to answer. Um, and I'm I'm trying to think back of what we actually did, and I don't know that it's particularly unique. But I have been fascinated by the apps that have been created out of this for the physical distancing piece of it, and kind of recognizing who you're around in terms of contact tracing, the ability that technology can take care of that for you and share it with you, or even just, you know, the temperature monitoring and, act, you know, access to our offices right now is built on a key card and won't open unless it scans your temperature and to get in. So for me, it was the technology piece. I don't know that it's particularly unique, but that's what really stands out for me. Well, I, I thought too, um, Laura, that the MLS, they tried, so, you know, in the, in the, the bubble, the first bubble, um, you know, they, I think they tried some innovating kind of broadcasting, um, uh, you know, little tweaks and touches to try to create an experience when we didn't really have a blueprint for that quite yet. And, um, and I don't know how much of those will stick as, as you move into the, to the next season, but I, I appreciated that they, they were taking a more innovative approach to kind of like, how do we, how do we spruce up this, this broadcast a bit? Yeah, I think even just the virtual tarps that you saw in the broadcast where they are covering the stands with actual tarps and, and sponsorship, I think was really cool. And I'm interested to see, you know, if that develops even as fans fill into the stands. Alan, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, the technology piece is certainly interesting. I, I, I agree with that. I, I wouldn't say this was necessarily innovative, but I was impressed with you know everyone's ability to scale testing, particularly at a time where you're seeing on national news that there's no tests and people are, that do get tested are waiting you know seven, 10, 14 days for results. And these organizations were able to execute just you know a significant number of tests in a rapid amount of time. And when you're talking about you know large groups that you're needing to test daily, it's quite a task. So while maybe not innovative, I think it's it's a very impressive operation that I don't think that people frankly thought could be pulled off. Olga, I know you just said you wanted to answer this question live. You want to weigh in? I don't know if he's there. I'm sorry. Can you say it again? Uh, I thought you had sent a note that you wanted to answer that question live. So I was going to give you an opportunity. 
Oh no, I, I was just sorry for the, the miscommunication. I was just making sure that we that we hit it there. There we go. Okay. Well, the next question is also really interesting. Is uh, and I think is important as we start talking about fans coming back. Fans got awfully comfortable sitting at home watching games, um, which is great. Except, is there now a conversation? Uh, among sports leagues and in college sports about the need to win back fans in the stands? Um, or, or do you have a pretty high level of confidence that fans are going to come back as soon as we all get the go ahead? Leah, why don't you start with that one? Sure. I mean, we definitely, we have a department here, people much smarter than I, that, that focus on fan engagement. Um, so I'm sure they have a lot of great ideas that I'm not aware of. But, you know, I think... I think people will want to come back. There's just a totally different experience being in a stadium, experiencing it live. And, you know, I think there's also something to being able to scream louder when the visiting team is on offense and wanting to kind of create that environment for your home team. So I think people will naturally come back. Um, definitely will take some effort on our part to just in, enhance that in stadium experience, um, keep them engaged and help them to feel safe while they're there. But um, I think people want to return to some sense of normalcy, including going into stadiums. Yeah, and while, while I would, while I generally am like, be careful of the, if you build it, they will come, you know, kind of mentality. I do think when you look at the grand scheme of things, it's a relatively minuscule number that you actually have to fill, you know, like a, a, in a stadium, even a stadium, right? Um, except maybe at, te- you know, with 90,000 or 100,000, but an NFL stadium, an NBA arena, MLS state, like, um, I think the challenge may not be that initial, you know, like, I think the, there's some pent up demand to come back and, and experience the live um, event. I think it'll be, how do we continue to create value for people as, as we return, as prices start to go back up for tickets and things and, and make this a unique experiential kind of um, part of, of people's ability to connect with and, and identify with a, with a team? Yeah, and I would say from my standpoint, I think people will be interested and it's more a question of can we make them feel safe and feel comfortable in the short term as they come back? I, I know personally now when I see a crowd, right, it just seems so unusual and you're used to having your space. And I think that's going to take a beat for a lot of people to get to get comfortable. So making sure that you are completely educating with everyone. Uh, this is going to be the stadium experience, right? As you walk in, you have a time, you move through your zone, you know, here's the rules, making people comfortable and making sure that you're enforcing that on site so that everyone feels safe coming in, knowing that people are going to follow the protocols. Is that the case, Alan, you think in college sports, um, maybe not the safety thing. I always assume that college sports will come roaring back just because I think of, you know, 100,000 people at the big house in the University of Michigan. But is that true? Yeah, they'll be back. I mean, (laughs) fan engagement is not my area by any means, but um, to me, it feels like it, it represents what's normal and they want what's normal and they miss that. And I almost think of all these fan engagement experiences where we've tried to make game day more than just a football game or more than just a basketball game. It's this event with all these other activities. And I think people are just going to want to come back and watch a good college football game. And they either want to do it with their friends and that's, that's what they remember. That's what they're, where they made memories and that'll be, you know, return, return to normalcy. So yeah, I think they'll, they'll definitely be back. Uh, this is a question from Devin Oliveira. I hope I said your name correctly. Um, and I'm going to actually expand on his question. He said, when developing COVID protocols, were your organizations adapting existing guidelines or crowdsourcing ideas as you went along? I would expand that is to as you're developing vaccine guidelines and return of fan guidelines, are, are, you, are you watching the other leagues? You're watching what's going on? Or are you, uh, are you sort of following CDC? How are, how are you doing this? Yeah, I'd say all of the above. I mean, absolutely collaborating with colleagues. We're watching what the NFL and other pro leagues do. Um, certainly that gives sort of a, a, a sense of confidence and, and a place to build from. But um, we were, I mean, I spent as much time talking to colleagues about how they were trying to get 
kids back in the building? Are you using locker rooms? If you are, how? Um, and that's that sort of lends itself to just the, the collaboration that occurred in the past year amongst all of our colleagues. We all counted on each other and their expertise. And you know, as you work through these things, every little detail mattered. And you, th you thought you had, you thread the needle and then there'd be an unintended consequence that you didn't think of. I mean, a prime example is one of the, one of the, the ways we, we got around kids eating together was giving them these cards for restaurants so they could go get a takeout. Well, lo and behold, they all went together and sat together and that's not what we were hoping for. So we just hadn't thought through and thought that that would be one of the unintended consequences. Um, but absolutely, I'm counting on, on anyone and everyone from CDC guidance to other leagues to, to colleagues to help us craft what we think is safest for our student athletes. Yeah, I'd agree. I think you want everyone's input. And I will say, I get the sense, this is certainly true in Chicago, but maybe in other jurisdictions, that teams across leagues are communicating so that within a city, you're all subject to the same guidelines, you're all talking to the same public officials and kind of moving as one body in, in what you're doing. So I feel like there's actually been a lot of communication just within the city across teams and leagues about what protocols you're putting in place and an effort, at least for us, to try and be consistent across those teams. Yeah, and from the NFL standpoint, you know, from the very beginning, um, there were several groups involved in developing the protocols. It's obviously led by health and safety, but management council, football ops, the NFLPA, we were all working um, to develop these protocols. And obviously the CDC guidelines served as that foundation, um, but eventually the CDC evolved their guidelines based on the NFL protocols. So it was really interesting just to see how things evolved. Um, and I think it's because with the contact tracing, we were able to learn what activities were high risk, how the virus transmitted, how long someone should be in quarantine. Um, and also we were the largest testing operation in the world. So it, it helped to test the, all of these people daily and just you know be able to see when someone turned positive and then understand what they did in the last 48 hours. So that really served as the basis for continuing the evolution of the protocols. Going forward, I mean, definitely we'll have to be heavily based on CDC, as well as looking at the other leagues and seeing what they're doing now as they're um, operating during this time. And um, it's, as we've always said, we will continue to develop the protocols as we learn more and uh, the science evolves. And to, and to Leah's point, you know, I, I think people may forget that Again, the, when we think about the role that sports are playing in these conversations, sports were like the laboratory for figuring out how to do this on such a rapid, you know, uh, you know, scalable way. Um, I, you know, I think of the NBA and their investment in like rapid testing that ended up being adopted for broader use. And to Leah's point, you know, the the sort of iteration between CDC and the, and sports leagues. And I thought it was actually a really a really cool um moment of of kind of seeing a process play out it was more fun for me than it was for you of seeing a, a process play out where sports are really collaborating and contributing to something that is is again bigger than sports uh, this seems like a good question to end this on um, do you think the sports industry is in a better position to handle major disruptions like the COVID pandemic, God forbid we ever have anything quite like this, but do you think it's, uh, sports is in a better position now to handle a major disruption after the last year? I would say we are. I mean, hopefully we don't ever have to go through something like that again, but we kind of have that formula now for working together, for developing work streams, um, and contingency planning for just the next big disruption. It's again about that collaboration and communication. And as long as we rely on that, um, I do think we're in a better position to handle anything else that may come up. Yeah, I'd agree with that for the exact same reasons. I agree as well. And I think that this showed that even huge organizations can be relatively nimble and that, that we could you know, postpone games and somehow reschedule them. 
didn't seem possible, uh, you know, in years past. I think we've learned that that anything is possible. I don't think anyone's ever described college sports as nimble, so that's good. <laughs> but but you're right. Like I I would agree with that, and and I think also it's like we better be better prepared for it um, after everything we've done. But I would also I would I would think about the way that we are investing in preparations as we move forward from a facility standpoint. What are we doing to sort of um, change our air handling systems to be you know like I, and I think that's going to be where we push some some kind of competition in some new cottage industries and stuff is how do we better virus proof ourselves as we move forward and um I, and I, I bet somebody's gonna make a lot of money you know figuring that out and, and contributing to that i do wonder how facilities are going to look different after this um like if you were building a new facility now or in the next few years how, how much different might that facility be what kind of different features would it have after what you just went through. Um, on that note, thank you all for joining us. I, I learned a whole lot. I hope all of you out there did as well. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Alan, Laura, Leah, and Matt. That was really, really good. Folks, if if we could do our silent clap, I know we can't hear our <laughs> attendees, but I'm sure they're cheering. Um, <clears throat> folks, thank you uh, for, for joining us. We're going to take a brief break, about seven minutes or so, and we'll be back at 530 Central with uh, panel number two on innovation and the future of the sports industry. And for folks just joining us, the chat is there. Feel free to comment. And if you've got questions as we move through the next panel, use the dedicated Q&A feature. Uh, and thanks again to Judy and the panel. This was truly, truly great. And um, we thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Thanks again.